All right. Good morning, guys. Um, so we're going to switch gears. We've been talking about globalization and development, and we'll kind of come back to that when I do immigration. Uh, but right now, we want to talk about monopoly and then the regulation of monopoly and antitrust. Um, so let's start off. I'm going to take this, I guess, in kind of four parts. Uh, one, I want to first cover the potential bad or what's the critique, why it might monopoly be bad. Uh, raise some questions about that is the next part. Then consider why monopolies can be good. And then look at the historical role of antitrust regulation and how that fits into this picture. Uh, so to start off, why <coughs> is monopoly bad? Or why might some people think monopolies are necessarily bad? Any idea? Competition. Hinders competition. Competition, smart petition. Who cares? What's the problem with that? Go ahead. How about just market monopoly right now? Prices will go up. Prices will go up. OK, why is that a bad thing? Because when prices go up, there's less money to buy stuff. And when there's less competition, people feel that prices will go up. When there's competition, prices are going to go up. OK, that's partially there, yeah. Um, I would take it one step further by saying that um, traditionally, they're associated with increasing prices while decreasing the value of the product received for that price. So mm -hmm. that they're able, because they have dominance in the market, they're able to get more money or take more money from the consumer than uh, the consumer actually gets in value. OK, so it's not just price is too high, but also quality can go down because competition isn't forcing to deliver a good product. OK, we're getting there. These are parts of it. What I want to do, for those of you, and I know it was about half of you who had some economics before, is just put up a simple graph that starts talking about why this is bad. For those of you who haven't had it, we'll be able to talk around it, and it doesn't matter. Um, but basically, the critique from economists of why monopolies would be bad is you have some demand for goods and services, right? So as prices are higher, people are going to buy fewer of them. As prices are lower, people are going to buy more of them. What this is measuring, the height of the curve at any time, is saying how much value do the consumers put on uh, a given unit of the product? So what's it worth to them? And for a monopolist, let's just make it simple. We'll say they have some constant cost of production, marginal cost of production, make it no fixed cost, so life is easy here. And if we're going to have efficiency in the world, so if we're going to have the greatest size of the economic pie, what you want competition to do is keep pushing price down until it reaches the cost of the product. Because what that means, this is the marginal cost is measuring what's the cost of taking away value other places in the world to create this product. Like when the business is making it, it has to hire labor, capital, uh, and other inputs, raw materials, in order to make it. Those things could all be used to make something else. How valuable is that something else? That's what the cost is me measuring. The other part is saying, well, how valuable is the product that you create? So what you want for efficiency in the world or for the greatest size of wealth for everybody is you want them to keep lowering price and keep trading out units right up to the point where the value to the last person who buys it equals the cost of production. Because each one of these, this was gains from trade. I traded a pen with you yesterday, right? I bought a pen for a dollar. Uh, presumably, I think you probably valued the dollar much more than the pen. So there's gains from trade in between us when we swap. What we want to have happen is everybody keeps swapping right up to the point that there's no more gains from trade to be had. And at that point, we've made the world as wealthy as possible. So this is what the process of competition generally pushes you towards, is pushing prices down to your marginal cost. Uh, and the problem that, are people OK with that so far? All right. So the problem that people have with monopoly, and actually, let's make this uh, concrete. Uh, Glaxo Smith Klein has a pattern on uh, the drug Comvair. Com anybody know what Comvair is? It's the, uh, known as the uh, AIDS cocktail, or the anti-AIDS cocktail. Um, and it costs them about 50 cents to produce it. But it doesn't sell for 50 cents in the United States. It sells about 12.50 per pill. Uh, for a person who has to have it, it means for the, over the course of the year, it's going to cost them roughly $10,000 for their prescription. So nowhere near down near their marginal cost. Why does GlaxoSmithKline charge such a high price? Because they can. Yeah. Because they can. Why can they? Well, 
there's no competition because they have a patent, in this case, a grant of government privilege that says nobody can duplicate it. Convair does sell it for 50 cents elsewhere. In India, they sell it for about 50 cents. Why? India doesn't respect the patent on Convair, so other people can make the drug too. And as a result, competition pushes your price down to around 50 cents. But not in the United States. In the United States, they face a trade-off. Every time they want to sell more pills, they have to lower their price on their existing pills. As a result, they take account of that. And what they're concerned about is their marginal revenue, or how much extra revenue they get each time they sell a pill. And if they wanted to sell more pills than they currently do, at $12.50, when they lower price to $12, they might sell some more pills. But then they lose that extra 50 cents per pill that they were making on all their prior ones. So they face this trade-off as they uh, lower price to sell more units, then they get a lower price for their existing ones. So they try to balance this, and where they maximize profit, if you've had econ before, you already know this. If not, just take my word for it. Where they maximize profit is where their marginal revenue equals their marginal cost. Oops. And this tells them what price to set. You look up and you say at that quantity, how much are demanders willing to pay for it? And it tells you about 12.50 in the United States. This is a monopoly, and the economist critique of this would be that they're restricting output, so they're lowering production in order to raise prices. Why is this bad? The economist critique of why it's bad is not because consumers pay these higher prices. These people up here, they all value the unit. They buy it for $12.50. If the price had been 50 cents, they would have got more gains from trade for the consumer. But they still buy it and get some. Business gets extra profits. Economics doesn't say anything about that. What the economists say is it's inefficient because all of these people here, they value it more than the cost of production. But because they raise price over cost of production so much, these people don't get to buy it. So this whole area here are potential gains from trades where buyers valued the unit more than it cost the sellers. But the trades never happen. The result is economists call this deadweight loss or just losses that nobody gets. So it's not a transfer. It's not like the monopoly benefits and gets extra profits and the consumer gets higher prices. It's these trades just don't happen, even though they could make both parties better off. This is the standard reason when economists say monopolies are inefficient and should be regulated. It's because of those losses right there. So it's the gains from trade that could occur but don't. Questions to this point? This is the fundamental economic critique of monopoly. Yes? Um, so if there's such a big dead weight or whatever, right, mm -hmm. if, they, if they lowered it, that space would decrease. But then what's the ratio of the price Not sure if I get you fully, but let me see if this cuts it. So what would happen if they lowered price? So right now, you can see what they make for total money, right? So I'm just going to make up a number. Let's say this is 10,000 pills. Right now, this is what it costs them to make 10,000 pills. They get this much profit, another $12 per pill times 10,000. If they lowered price to sell more, let's say they dropped their price to $10. Now the game changes. You get more total units sold, but lower prices, so they'd lose all that revenue up there to gain some of this revenue here. But that's bigger than this, so they don't do it. So that's what's making them restrict the price, uh, restrict the quantity to get the higher price and not capture any of this dead weight loss over here. Is that what you were trying to get at? Yeah. OK. So the key is that you have to lower price so you lose the revenue on your old units to get that little bit of new units. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes monopolies are able to do it. So price discrimination, it's called. Sounds bad, right? Because we're always told like discrimination equal bad. All it means is charging different people different prices. Like movie theaters, like, movie theaters, like restaurants, like schools. Like it's very common. Price discrimination is everywhere around us in this world. So it means charging different people different prices. What did you have in mind at the movie theater? Like the Friday night is more expensive. Or 
more for the latter, so for seniors and for students. Why do movie theaters say cheaper prices for seniors and students? Because they're nice? They like little kids? No. What they understand is seniors and students are more likely to be some of the people who are down here and not willing to pay this high price. So they charge a high price to the normal people who would pay it. And then they give you a lower price to the students and the seniors because they can still make a profit off you. And it's not perfect. There might be some students or seniors who would be up here and willing to pay and some other adults who would be down here. But it's a pretty good sort of trying to figure out where you are. Same thing with restaurants and senior discounts. Uh, you, the best at doing this, or one of the best at doing this, is universities. So when you all apply to college, how many of you, where are you, how many of you are senior, gonna be seniors in high school? A few, actually about half of you. All right, so next year if you're applying to college, you're all probably gonna fill out, they call it the FAFSA form, the financial aid form. And then you apply to a bunch of colleges. You already did that? Yeah, I'm going to college next year. All right. So what's a college do? They give you scholarships, right? They advertise that their price is, you know, $35,000. Then we give you this scholarship and that scholarship and this subsidized loan. And, that. and some of it's merit. Some of it actually really is merit. Some of it's merit that's fake. And some of it's, quote, need. Makes it feel like they're being nice, right, trying to get everybody. BS. What they're doing is price discriminating. Those people who can pay the high price, they charge the high price. Those people who can't pay the higher price, they charge you the lower price. What information is kind of crucial to price discriminate well? How about let's get all the info about their income, their parents' income, their savings, their debt. This is a pretty good way to price discriminate, right? So price discrimination is common. It happens all around us. In fact, uh, I encourage you, if you ever go out, to, some of you will probably be buying cars in the next few years. You go to the car dealership and they're going to talk to you and they're basically trying to see if your demand curve is like written on your forehead because they want to figure out what price you'll pay and that's what they want to charge you. So what you want to do is use that in your favor and make sure they think you're somewhere down low on the demand curve, not somewhere up high. So you're like, you don't like walk in and like, yeah, you know, it's Mustang. I really have to have a Mustang. You're like, yeah, you know, Camaros are kind of nice. I guess I'm looking at this Mustang. So you're like, there's things you'd swap to. But then when they try to be nice and they're like, hey, let's take it out for a test drive. But, you know, before you do, here, fill out this loan app so we can have our financing department start working on that while we're out taking a drive. And then it'll speed us up when we come back. Don't do it. <laughs> what are you going to write on the loan app? Your income, your debt, all of the things that allow them to price discriminate. So then he's going to talk about price when you come back. So you've got to instead fake them out. You can't be like, I'm paying cash because that's a bad signal of where you're going to be on the demand curve. But you can be like, oh, my aunt works at the credit union and you know, she promised she could get a good rate, so I don't need to fill this out. Either that or just fill it out and lie. Um, cut your income by 50% and raise your debt by 200% and then watch the guy like sweating and thinking like, okay, how am I going to talk him out of the Mustang and get him into a Fusion or a Fiesta or something? Uh, all right, so back to GlaxoSmithKline. So they do charge other prices sometimes where they can price discriminate. So in Africa, they sell it for close to 50 cents a pill um, because Africa, there's a big market for it or a big need for it, but incomes there are very low, so they can't afford to pay the type of prices in Europe. So they sell it at a cheaper price in Africa than what they do in Europe and the United States. What does this seem like it opens up the opportunity to do? Import the cheap stuff from Africa, right? Arbitrage it, right? Buy it for 50 cents a pill there, bring it back to Europe, sell it there. People have tried to do this. What they actually do is they sell different color pills. I forget which way it goes. Uh, I think it's red ones in Africa. I'm not positive, though. They sell a different color pill there, and it's illegal to import them back into Europe. So they actually pr prosecute people for smuggling drugs illegally who do that. So they're using the law to try to prevent arbitrage. So if you're going to price discriminate, you have to be able to prevent the reselling. Other markets, you see it in like DVDs. Any of you ever try to buy a foreign DVD? They're a lot cheaper, but they won't work in US DVD players. So you can buy the, they sell it cheaper in India, but it's coded to only work with Indian DVD players. Same thing with video game systems, too. So you gotta get like the chip, and I know some people are like capable of wiring all these things up and making it work, but basically, they're controlling your ability to resell. However, so back to this price discrimination part. Is it bad? No, it's good, because what's it doing if they can sell at a cheap price in one market and a high price in the other? it starts eliminating these deadweight losses. So instead of no Africans getting the drug, even though they value it more than 50 cents, now a bunch of them do. Yes? So if they're eliminating the deadweight losses, then why would economists think that's bad? Only, they only fully eliminate it if they do it perfectly. So if you actually price discriminated like everybody had their demand curve on their forehead and you charged each one the maximum willingness to pay, you'd totally eliminate it. In practice, that never happens. 
So you have various ways of trying to approximate it, um, but you're still going to be left with dead late losses just smaller than what there is there. But they just try to minimize it as much as possible. Uh, yes. Well, if, if they're capable. The firm doesn't care about minimizing dead weight losses. The firm cares about profiting, right? But if you minimize dead weight losses, you're going to get more profit. Right. They care about making as much profit as possible. The better they price discriminate, the more profit they get. They come up with really creative ways of doing it. So other things actually that are going to come up when we get to antitrust, tying and bundling. So if you saw the mic knew about the Microsoft case from when you were younger, right? They tied and they bundled products together. Well, what's they're forms of price discrimination. Things that eliminate deadweight losses from monopoly is what these things are. So tying, actually, here's a good example. How many of you guys uh, have bought computer printer ink? Oh, my God. Thank you. It's expensive, right? More expensive than printer something. More ex doesn't that seem bizarre? It's like what printers do. Why do they do this? Because they can. Not because they can. Well, yes, they can. By definition, they do it because they can. But that's not their only reason. It's a form of price discrimination. So let's take a printer and sell it for really cheap. Then let's sell the ink for expensive. What does that do? Well, let's say if we have a demand curve just like that for printers and ink together. Who are the people who are going to have a really high willingness to pay for it? Probably the people who print out lots of paper and lots of pictures, right? Someone like myself at home, I print once a month probably. I wouldn't want to pay a lot to have a printer at home. But when the printer's really cheap, and I only need one ink cartridge every couple of years, I don't mind buying one. If the printer were really expensive and the ink cheap, I wouldn't end up buying one. Because my total price of printer plus ink to me is fairly low. But for the people who print a lot, their total price to them is really high. Because you pay 50 bucks for the printer and then 40 bucks for each ink cartridge, one after another, after another, after another, right? That's a way to price discriminate. Doing it on the margin of letting people self-select and actually determine how much total they're going to pay you. How do they do it? Again, it's a patented component so that somebody else can't make the printer uh, cartridge that goes into their printer. So how do some people get around this with the arbitrage? Anybody bought refilled ink? That's the way around it. But it's kind of a pain in the neck, so most people don't bother to do it. But it's another way to eliminate deadweight losses. But ironically, what we find then is when we start getting into antitrust law, some of the things that get rid of inefficiencies are things that you get prosecuted for. Um, all right, so some questions then. So that's kind of the bad. Actually, from you guys, questions at this point? Yes? Um, uh, what are the two curves? Uh, that's the, um this is the demand, which is buyer's valuation of things. This is the cost. And then the second line? This is the extra, the revenue from each unit towards the firm. Um, don't get hung up on the lines. For those, some of you who have had some of this, this makes it easier for the rest of you. The important takeaway point is that there's buyers who value it greater than the cost of making it. They don't do the swap because it gets an extra revenue from other people. That's the inefficiency. Um, okay, some questions on this. What is the relevant marginal cost? How do we know or identify in the world a monopoly being harmful. So we could identify a monopoly and just say, it's a single seller. But just because they're a single seller doesn't mean they're behaving like this. In fact, actually, let's raise that question first. Define a monopoly for me. A corporation that has major control over an industry. Oh, maybe. That's pretty, bro actually. All of these are going to be pretty broad, so I'm not going to be like, aha, you didn't get it. Uh, okay, we'll take this. I think, um, I mean, I looked it up a while ago, and I think the technical definition is that basically they have a corner on the market. So Corner on the market. So they're the single seller in the market. Uh, not necessarily, but the dominance that they have basically makes it an easy win for them. Easy win, okay. The rock and then... I'm a history junkie, so I'm seeing the Rockefeller, he was the oil company, he took over and made a monopoly of it, so that would be the one who takes total control over it. Okay, so at his most, he had about 90% of the market share, so it doesn't have to be literally a single seller, but just the dominant, maybe and this is what you're getting at, to the dominant seller that's clearly the dominant seller in the market, yeah. I would just like to argue that uh, natural monopolies are not harmful, so therefore you should not define natural monopolies as monopolies themselves. 
Okay, I'm not going to argue about definitions. Make sure I come back to national and natural monopoly. I'll do that in a couple minutes. All right. So all of these things beg a question, though, as you're using these phrases. A single seller in the market. Well, what's the market? And a single seller of what? These things, does independent institute have a monopoly on libertarian scholarship? No. Okay. What market are we talking about? Scholarship. Where? In Spanish? <laughs> we do have El Espanol, uh, Espanol uh, Independent, or El Independent. What's the website? Something like that. Um, <laughs> we don't have it anymore? Oh, we have it. Oh. I don't remember it. Okay. Um, how about this? Does the Independent Institute have a monopoly on the production of libertarian scholarship in Oakland, California? Okay, so it's a monopoly then. Okay, well, what way should we define it? This is a problem of what's the relevant market, right? So anything, if you define its market narrowly enough, can be a monopoly. Anything, if you define its market broadly enough, cannot be a monopoly. Precisely where there isn't a scientific answer of what makes one a monopoly and not. So in some sense, nobody's a monopoly because even if there was only one seller of computers in the world, well, you're also competing against other products for people's money, not just computers. Is the market computers or is the market everything people might spend their money on? So what economists do is they'll come up with what you call them cross-price elasticities. Look at how sensitive uh, someone's responsiveness to changes in price in one market is to another. Um, and they'll pick particular numbers and say, okay, we're gonna define it as a monopoly within this range. But as we look through like the court history of this, it's not uncommon when you see a case go through different levels of the court and one judge defines the market one way, you're guilty. The next guy on appeal defines the market differently, you're not guilty. The next appeal defines the market another way, guilty again. There's no set thing that tells us, yes, it is a monopoly, no, it's not. Um, your corner grocer, he's a monopoly if you define grocers within so many blocks of your house. But if you include Peapod where you can go online, there's no grocer in any relevant market that is a monopoly. Or is Peapod the monopoly because they're the only grocer online who will deliver to you? <laughs> like, this stuff starts getting kind of baffling. Uh, Alan Greenspan once said, the world of antitrust is like Alice's Wonderland. Everything seemingly is, yet apparently isn't simultaneously. Um, and that was in his interpretation. Actually, I'll give you a different quote from him later um, of the history of applying antitrust laws to it. You wanted to say something? Uh, you answered my question. Okay. Uh, okay, so the next part of this is, so one, what's the relevant market? Two. How do we know that this rather than this is what's going on? You can be a single seller. If you're afraid someone's going to come in and compete with you, maybe you think the second I raise price, someone else is going to enter the market and they'll push my price down so I won't be able to do this. So maybe I behave this way and keep producing right down your marginal cost anyway so no one else enters. How do we know if a firm's doing the high price rather than that? barriers to entry into a market, right? Okay, so we can look for barriers to entry, and I'm gonna get, by the way, make sure at some point, I have to come back to the actually bad at the end. Uh, but how do we know their pricing? Not whether there's barriers to entry. Yeah? Okay, so you're saying that uh, the monopoly would keep the price down around like 50 to make sure nobody else could enter the market, right? Yes, possibly. What's wrong with that? Nothing. But how do we know? So this is the point. I'm going to show you a historical case where they do exactly what you want the process of competition to do, and they were prosecuted for it. Um, but presumably, if they're doing that, you wouldn't want to prosecute them for that. But the point is, I can draw it on a blackboard, but in the real world, we don't know. So competition isn't like an end state in the way like an economic textbook principles would have you in perfect competition. Competition's a rivalrous process. We don't know what every buyer valuation is of a good. We don't know somebody else's marginal cost of production. Sure, we can look at accounting costs, but all costs are really opportunities foregone. What values do people attach to those? Outside the mind of the chooser, there's no way a scientist can know these things. Costs are subjective. As a result, what we're seeing in the real world is the process of competition of firms trying to figure these things out. The 
concept of like static monopoly in that sense ceases to have a lot of meaning. When we're prosecuting them for doing things that don't follow from perfect competition is to assume that the market already knows the very thing the market process is supposed to find out. We don't know what goods are valued by who. We don't know how much they value them. We don't know the optimal way to make production. Not all firms have access to the same production technology. These are things that the process of competition discovers for us. But until that process of competition happens, we don't know them. And in fact, as it's happening, the end result that it has to be tending towards is changing all the time. So you never actually get there. So in terms of a market clearing or a market equilibrium where everything's completely mutually adjusted, we never get there because it's a moving point. It's like if you've ever been to a, actually you probably haven't ever been to a dog track. Uh, if you know what a dog track is, right? The dogs run around the racetrack chasing a little mechanical rabbit. They're always getting to where the mechanical rabbit was, but they're never actually catching the rabbit. Same thing's happening in a market process. The process of competition is pushing you towards mutual coordination, but the very data of the market change as the competition's happening, so it's like you're tending towards a moving point. But that means we don't know scientifically how to say who's a harmful monopoly in this sense and who's not. Um, it's a fundamental problem. Actually, Independent Institute has a great book um, by Dominic Armentano that goes into detail on the process of competition versus the static state. Uh, I think it's called Antitrust and Monopoly. Um, how about some of the good? Why can monopoly be good? Well, forget monopoly. Forget for them. Okay. Yes, obviously. Why it could be good for society. Yeah. If it's the best product, then it's best for everyone that they be allowed to give it to. Okay, so some monopolies occur just because the firm innovates a particular product yeah. that no one else exactly copies. Or just they are the best at what they do. So like the like, iPad. So like the iPad. Okay. Or, so, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, um, in that book you mentioned, um, he specifically focuses on the Microsoft versus Netscape um, scandal. Uh, and Windows, um, or sorry, Microsoft just had a much better way of doing it than Netscape, to where the consumer got infinitely more in the bundle the package. And um, for the first time, they combined their browser with the computer, and mm -hmm. that provided the best value for them. Mm -hmm. At the time. And let's. I want to come back to Microsoft, but give me a few minutes before them. So let's take a simple one. One good part of this, potentially, innovation. If you know you can make monopoly profits, it gives you a greater incentive to come up with the product in the first place. So maybe this is what a couple of you are getting at with saying a new great product. If you don't think you're going to make any profits, what's the point of innovating? So in GlaxoSmith's Klein's case, and I'm not going to take a firm position on intellectual property here in this lecture, but uh, in their case, they get a patent on it that protects them. Probably essential given the regulatory environment in the United States that they have such a patent because it takes about a billion dollars in 10 years to bring a new drug to market. If you're looking at a billion dollars of upfront cost in 10 years, do you ever innovate it if you don't think you're going to have a monopoly on it afterwards? Probably not. Now, I've got my whole spiel on the FDA, and I, I think it's ridiculous that it costs this much to bring a drug to market in the United States, and we should just have certification rather than licensing of the drugs. So those costs could come way down, but given the environment we operate in, giving them a patent on it is probably necessary to get innovation in medicine. More generally, without patents, innovation, even when you're just going to get temporary monopoly profits, so maybe you don't need the protection from competition, but the fact that you're going to compete with other people makes you innovate new products so that you can price above marginal cost. So this is like, this is just a static picture. It's a snapshot in time. But it can be, over time, the ability to get profits gets you the innovation that's the new profits that we all desire and want in this process. So it could be these static snapshots of inefficiency. That's fine. It's the price you pay to have a dynamic market that gives you new products over time. So on net, you're more efficient to have it this way. Um, Another reason it can be good. Uh, somebody said economy, uh, natural monopoly, or economies of scale. When it would be more costly to have a bunch of small firms produce the output rather than one big firm do it. So basically, 
in terms of this graph. Instead of having this cost curve, if you broke it up and had a bunch of firms serve the market, they'd all have cost curves way up here. Prices would even be higher. So easy example of this. Uh, local cable television. Does it make sense to have two companies in the same city? Why not? Even if so. What's the big cost for cable? What's the extra cost of one extra subscriber viewing the broadcast? It's basically zero, right? What's their big cost? Stringing the lines to be able to serve the whole area. Would it make sense to string the lines twice so two different companies compete? No, the cost is going to be twice as high. It's a nat what we'd call a natural monopoly. One firm can serve the market more cheaply than another. In that case, with the monopoly, you get better prices than what you would under competition. Now, some will be tempted to say, we should regulate those, so we'll allow the monopoly and regulate it. I'm not going to have time today to go into regulation, but I'll just say that it often perverts the incentives of the regulation that you give that destroy innovation over time. Um, and for that matter, also lead to higher costs. Uh, actually, cable television would be an example of, of it when uh, it was more heavily regulated. You only had basic channels. Once they went to deregulation and cable pricing, uh, prices went up. But we started getting HBO and now in whatever 500 channels that you have today. And despite prices going up, more people subscribed, giving you an indication that despite the higher prices, people value the product more. Uh, once you started getting the innovation. The other thing is, today's inefficiencies are tomorrow's profit opportunities. If you observe, yeah, remember that one. Today's inefficiencies, those are tomorrow's profit opportunities. If you observe monopoly profits, that's like a big signal to everybody else. Of come in and find a way to compete in this market. So the natural monopoly that was cable television, how is it not a natural monopoly in the relevant market anymore? Yes. Is this competitor out in TV television? Well, there are still cable television. In fact, I get it at my house. But I've also, when I lived out here, I didn't have it. Dish TV, Direct TV, other satellite TV providers. Internet TV. Internet TV. All of these things are innovations that, for that matter, phone service would be the same thing, local phone service. How many of you don't even have a landline in your house? Just one of you? Once you get to college student age, most people don't have landlines anymore. They all just have cell phones. To me, that's still weird. I need like a landline in my house. Um, but basically, been competed away. So uh, economies of scale would be a reason to have a monopoly. And to the extent that they're doing this monopoly profiting, it gives a big signal for others to come in and try to compete in the market. Next one, how about network goods? Network goods are goods where the value to one user depends on how valuable the good is to other users, or t depends more on how many other people use it, really. So how many of you would go on Facebook if you were the only person you knew who used it? It doesn't work very well, right? OK, Google Plus. They had their little burst when they first came on, right? And then nobody used them. Social networking is actually you might guess by the name of it, a network good. Its value, any one of the products value to you is higher the more people will use it. That means it's efficient to have a monopoly or a few firms that dominate the market. So in those type of markets, what you see is competition for the market instead of competition in the market. What you see is one firm that dominates and others come in and nip and try to get in, fail, 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 and then when one succeeds, totally displaces them and they become the new monopoly. So the competition is over who gets to be the monopoly. Um, other things that are like, so you guys haven't had experience probably with online dating services, but Match.com dominates the market because who wants to go on a dating site that doesn't have anybody you can date? <laughs> How do people compete with it? They find sub-markets. So then there's like J-Date. It's for people who only want a Jewish partner, so you don't have to sort through everybody else. There's the same thing for a born-again Christian one. There's even one called Ashley Madison. I don't know if you've seen the ads on TV for that one. <clears throat> it shows like two people making out, fall on a bed, and these people very passionate with each other or so. Or these people are married, but not to each other. AshleyMadison.com. It's the dating site for people who are married who want to have affairs. 
So the first time I saw the ad, I was like, oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> but it's, again, market niche then, and then a single firm that dominates within the market. Um, so you mentioned Netscape before and the move to Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer got virtually all the market share, about 80, 80 85%. How many of you use Internet Explorer now? You actually do? I actually do sometimes. How many of you use Google instead, Google Chrome? How many use Firefox? What happened basically is Firefox knocked out the market share, became the dominant one. Google Chrome is in the process of becoming that now. It's so again. Uh, <laughs> so here's another thing with networking. So let's go to word processing then because it's even more clear. Microsoft Word. Everybody uses Microsoft Word. People who don't piss me off. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not, listen, so a student who was working on a paper with me sent me something that they had used Google Docs. It didn't translate all of the footnotes correctly. I sent it back to him and said, anything that's not in Microsoft Word doesn't count. <laughs> the value to, of Microsoft Word is dependent on everybody else being compatible with it. So again, you tend to be one firm that dominates it. And how do the other firms compete then? So for Open Office or Google Docs, what price do they charge? Zero. That's what they have to do to try to get their foot in. So they come in with a zero price good. Remember the problem with Internet Explorer when the case came up? They're giving it away for free. So this is what we want competition to do. <laughs> so the competitors come in, they try to give it away for free so that they can become the dominant one and then make money off it. And then someone else tries to cut in. But Microsoft didn't always dominate in word processing or spreadsheets. It used to be Word Perfect and Lotus 1, 2, 3. <laughs> you guys haven't even heard of that, huh? That would be the early 1990s. So by mid-90s, Microsoft displaced it. Someday Microsoft's going to get displaced as the dominant one there. But it's going to have to be when someone comes up with a good enough product that can overcome that network externality. But anyway, and it could be Google Docs, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, so you all are part of the equilibrium. So go do what you're going to do, but don't send me anything that's not in Microsoft Word. Uh, but what if we can't? Then you fail if you're my student. It's <laughs> But this would be another reason you wouldn't want to break up monopoly, though. If something's a network good, by definition, it's efficient to have a single provider or a few dominant providers in it. You wouldn't want to break it up. Um, let's briefly look at where antitrust came from and some of the things that it's done. Uh, and remind me to get back to the actually bad before we end this. Um, so the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 is the first act that makes the monopolies illegal. Um, it's followed up by the Clayton Act in 1914, which put more specific provisions in of what activities would be prohibited. Um, remember now, if monopoly power means anything, it means the ability to restrict output and raise price. Incidentally, by the way, in 1890, when they passed the Sherman Act, economists didn't yet have a theory of perfect competition and monopoly that was like this that would tell you it's inefficient. So it wasn't like they consulted with the economists and the economists were like, yeah, there's inefficiencies, they should pass this law. They hadn't even developed the economic theory that would tell them that yet. Most economists at the time were actually against it uh, because most economists were in favor of the economies of scale that large firms were bringing. Um, but either way, to know if there's going to be any inefficiency, this is what we need to look for. Well, the Congress was nice enough that they gave us a list of industries that they thought were monopolized. Uh, it included salt, petroleum, zinc, steel, coal, uh, or a particular type of coal, steel rail, sugar, lead, liquor, twine, iron, nuts and washers, that's weird, jute, castor oil, cottonseed oil, leather, uh, linseed oil, and matches. Another weird one. Um, there's an economist, uh, Tom DiLorenzo, who did a study back in the 80s where he looked at all of these industries then and said, well, were they restricting output and raising prices? So he looks in the decade prior to the passage of the law, what these industries did over the decade. Uh, the real economy increased by about 24% over that time. So if these industries just expanded like everything else, we should see 24% exp expansion in them. If they were doing something like this, we might expect to see less than 24% expansion indicating that they're restricting output to raise prices. What do we find? <sighs> On average, for all of those industries, real output increased 175%. Steel? 258%, 156% for zinc, 153% for coal, petroleum, 80%, sugar, 75%. They weren't restricting output to raise prices. They were dramatically expanding output. What was happening to prices? 
So average price level declined 7% over the decade. So again, if they were just like average, they would have 7% decline in their price over the decade. Uh, what do we got? Steel rails fell by 53%. Sugar, 22%. Uh, and another four and a half cents after that. Uh, lead, 12%. Zinc, 20%. Coal, uh, where are we here? Uh, I think 29%. So basically, what you're seeing is these industries are dropping prices faster than the economy. So we're getting expanding output, lowering prices. That's the opposite of this. It's doing what the process of competition should be doing. It's telling me they might be single sellers, but those single sellers are single sellers because they're creating new technologies and being better at production than other people. They're lowering prices so other people can't come into the market then. Now, some people might say, what about predatory pricing? Could they be pricing below cost just so they get their evil monopoly and can raise their prices later? There's big problems with predatory pricing theoretically, but in this particular instance, this is really easy. You can't predatory price for a decade while you lead the market. There's no way you can hope to recoup those profits later by raising price because somebody will be able to re-enter, and it's just a massive, you cannot predatory price for a decade. It's nuts. Yeah? And if you're predatory pricing, um, doesn't that mean that you're actually helping the consumers would like that. I mean, consumers would like everything to be free. So In the short run, they'd like it. The critique would be what's going to happen is once you crowd everybody out, then you're going to jack up your prices even higher to make up for it and screw them over. But then people can come back in. The argument would have to be that there's some barrier to entry that prevents c people from coming back in. In most cases, that argument will not hold, which is why most economists are pretty skeptical. Anybody t says that someone's using price discriminate, excuse me, is using predatory pricing in order to get a monopoly. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a classic article in journal number one of the journal, uh, issue number one of the journal of law and economics by McGee uh, on predatory pricing. This is like 1957-ish or whatever that basically emasculates the topic. Um, so wrong out there. All right, so let's take a look at a couple individual cases. Standard Oil, so one of you mentioned them earlier. So Standard Oil was prosecuted under the antitrust statutes. The case came down in 1911 and eventually broke up the company. So Rockefeller, incidentally, by the way, Rockefeller, probably the greatest environmentalist of the 19th century. Why? He saved the whales. They were hunting the whales extinct for their oil to make kerosene. Rockefeller came up with a cheaper way to get kerosene. As a result, it became uneconomical to hunt whales. So if you've ever seen a whale, thank Rockefeller. If it wasn't for his innovation, you probably wouldn't see them today. Um, side point. Okay, so in 1870, when he organized the company into Standard Oil, uh, he had a 4% market share of the kerosene market, and it was selling for 26 cents a gallon. By 1880, he had got up to 80 to 85% of the market share. So in a decade, he goes from being a small producer to being basically the market in it. What happens over this time? From 1870 to 1855, kerosene dropped from 26 ga cents a gallon to 8 cents a gallon. By 1897, it had fallen under 6 cents a gallon while he was the monopoly. Well, what was he doing? He was relentlessly innovating ways to lower cost and to create byproducts for additional revenue out of it. So he employed a bunch of chemists. They came up with 300 different products that you could make from the byproducts of making kerosene. Uh, he bought his own, he hired his own coopers to uh, lower the price of his barrels. Basically, he was doing the market process of competition, innovating the new ways and lowering prices that would want to see happen. It gave him a dominant market share. Did it allow him, though, to be immune from competition? Before the antitrust verdict ever came down, Rockefeller was already losing his market share. He missed it on two issues, or he was late coming to it on two things. What two major things happened around the turn of the century for the market for oil in the United States? Yeah? Cars. Cars. Switch from kerosene to gasoline as your main production. He was slow on that. Next. Where did Rockefeller get his oil? On land. Uh, okay, yes, on land. What land in particular? America. We've got to go from very broad to more specific. We've got land, America. Texas. Nope. Kansas. Nope. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania and Ohio codes western uh, end of Pennsylvania. Uh, big, in a big change in the oil market around the turn of the century, oil boom in Texas. Rockefeller was late getting there. Cost of Texas oil is much lower than the cost of getting oil out of Pennsylvania. Uh, so those two things, he ceased to be the guy who was innovating and beating everybody else to it in the marketplace. The result, um, he got a market share of a high of around 90% in the late 1890s. 
It was down to 68% by 1907 and down to 64% by 1911 before the antitrust verdict came down. So basically, he lost a third of his market share over that time. So he wasn't immune from competition by being a big monopoly. He was just very good at it for a long time. Then he blew it a couple times, and he started losing market share. He didn't need antitrust to break him out. Um, the next case I'll mention is Alcoa case. Uh, Alcoa Aluminum, they were the sole domestic producer of virgin aluminum. Um, and it had about 90% of the total market share, about 10% being imports. And they were brought up in 1937 on antitrust trust charges. The case was finally resolved, I think, in 1945. Um, and it's particularly troubling of the verdict that came down in this case. Um, well, first, actually, this is a classic case of when a court found them to be a monopoly because they defined the market as domestic producer of virgin ingot. So they're the only ones who made aluminum from scratch. The next court said, well, you can me melt down secondary aluminum that's already been used and reuse it in something, and it's physically identical, so we'll count that. And in that case, you don't have a big market share, so you're not a monopoly. And the next one came back and said, you are a monopoly. Uh, but here is the, the, judge that came down, the judgment that came down from Judge Hand. Listen to this. This is what he's saying you're guilty of. <coughs> It was not innovatable that Alcoa should always anticipate increases in the demand for ingot and be prepared to supply them. Nothing compelled it to keep doubling and redoubling its capacity before others could enter the field. It insists it never excluded competitors, but we can think of no more effective exclusion than progressively to embrace each new opportunity as it opened and to face every newcomer with new capacity already geared into a great organization having the advantage of experiment, experience, trade connections, and elite personnel. Guilty. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> this is a textbook description of what you want the process of competition to do. <laughs> That's what they were doing. Um, ultimately, in this case, so the judgment came through guilty, but it was during World War II, uh, and they delayed implementing it until after the war, and then eventually the thing got resolved after the war, and they never got fully broken up. Um, but it's just like, this is like at its worst. Now, I should say antitrust laws evolved over time. So um, it's evolved not because of new statutes being passed, but just because of case law. This is, that is some of its worst. Uh, but as economists developed more theories in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, the shift changed more and more, and antitrust, well, it's still pernicious, is not nearly as bad as what it used to be. Uh, and then, so the Microsoft case then, here you've got somebody who's selling a network good, who's tying a product which is engaging in price discrimination, which gets you efficiency, and they're getting prosecuted for this. Uh, incidentally, by the way, I should mention, the, what's the, historical reason for the passage of antitrust at this time. If economists didn't have these theories, why did Congress go ahead and do it? I think a lot of it, and this is my speculation of just reading the history on it, is jealousy and power shift in the United States. So the traditional political elite were the landed aristocracy in the United States. All of this production was creating new wealth that was a threat to their power. What's one way to deal with it? Well, we still control Congress. We're going to throw antitrust laws on that can try to limit the power of these new sources of wealth that are competing with us. Uh, and in particular, actually, Sherman, it also can be just a cover for other policies you're doing. Sherman was an uh, anti-free trade guy. So he was big on protective tariff. Well, what's a protective tariff do but encourage monopoly? So what do we do to show we're anti-monopoly? We'll pass an anti-monopoly law, but then we'll pass more tariffs. Um, let's talk about, related to that, then, finally, the actually bad. Some monopolies are bad. Adam Smith, when he had used to talk about monopoly, what he meant was a grant of government privilege. It means no one else can come in and compete with you. Government says there'll be a single producer or a limited number of producers. Now the process of competition is stifled. Now you're getting the inefficiencies of the restricting output to raise price, and you're preventing the competitive process from learning what the new and optimal way to deliver the services. We have lots of these in the United States today and lots of them around the world. These type of monopolies are harmful and in fact they're even more harmful than that deadweight loss because once you know you can get a profit by having a grant of government privilege, what do you do? Before you even do that, so you don't have one right now, but you know if the government gives you a grant of privilege, you could have one. <coughs> you go and you lobby the government, right? So now, the Loss gains from trade isn't your only deadweight loss. It's also misdirected entrepreneurship. Remember that productive, unproductive, destructive entrepreneurship? That's destructive entrepreneurship. Now entrepreneurs are spending their time going to Washington, lobbying to get grants of monopoly privilege for themselves. Actually, even worse than that, antitrust law itself 
creates this type of rent-seeking and unproductive entrepreneurship. If you can't compete with Microsoft with consumer dollars, how can you compete with them? In court. Take them up on antitrust charges. Encourage the government to take them up on antitrust charges. Actually, most antitrust suits are private, by the way, so it's not just the government who prosecutes them. Private uh, people can bring suit, too. Yeah? Also, with all these um, wars with patents in the technology uh, world, that's a, another type of destructive entrepreneurship. All right. I'm, I'm not going to take a firm position on the intellectual property right. thing here. Um, I think both sides have valid points that they make on it, uh, of whether it's there certainly is a degree of rent seeking that goes on with trying to get patents. And maybe it encourages too, too much innovation in some places. I think the reasonable argument is giving patents on new innovations prevents people from copying them for a certain amount of time, which gets you more innovation. I think other people's response to that is competition gets you just as much innovation without the protection of a patent. Look at something like fashion, which basically has no patent protection, where you get innovation all the time. and. My suspicion is that actually I don't have a unified position on it because I don't think one is correct for all industries. My suspicion is patents in some industries make sense and patents in others don't. But it's not a firm one that I'm willing to go to bat on. Um, but I see both sides of the argument in that. But what I will say is definitely bad ones are grants of government privilege that are the run of the mill norm, not for innovation. So the American Medical Association's monopoly over new doctors. So it defines how medical care can be given, who can practice it, what uh, nurses are allowed to perform and not perform, so that you end up having to go to see high cost doctors instead of seeing lower cost practitioners for other things that you might need. This makes me particularly nuts, actually. The only person I've made call me Dr. Powell was my medical doctor, because I wanted to like equalize footing with him, because he liked to talk down to me. Um, tons of examples, actually, so that's an example of occupational licensure. Tons of them throughout the United States. I've been in a battle with the Massachusetts Association of Realtors lately, uh, showing that they put in extra uh, continuing education requirements to crowd out part-timers out of the business so that their full-time members can make more money. So after a decade of doing it, what I showed was once they put in this continuing education, supposedly because they said, we're going to increase quality. Well, we looked at complaints to the real estate board and guilty verdicts. We find no relationship to having continuing education and any improvement there. We do find that they lowered the number of realtors by more than 50%, 50 uh, and that they increased their incomes by close to 20%. Um, so I've been doing little exposés on them in, in the Boston papers. It's kind of been fun. Uh, but those type of monopoly grants uh, through occupational licensure um, or just general grants of monopoly privilege, that creates inefficiencies of both the deadweight loss style there but also the rent-seeking, unproductive entrepreneurship style. But you don't need antitrust law to fix it. What you need is not giving you got grants of government privilege in the first place. Last question and then I think we're out of time. I was just going to ask, is there anything actually bad about having So sticking with just the example of monopoly here, because I'm not willing to go broader for this lecture in the last 30 seconds, the argument would be, this is what's wrong with it. And that your value judgment would then say, this is more important than overriding the questions we have about whether you actually can measure this anyway, the process of competition versus end state, whether these other good things you get out of it aren't worth it, whether you don't actually make things worse with antitrust law right. or regulation. But where it would come down to is that's what they'd be focusing on. Uh, my reading of it is the judgment of after you look at all of these things, we shouldn't have a need for antitrust law in the United States. It's mostly used to create harm rather than to do good. So with that, let's take our 15-minute break, Kyle. Yep. All right. And I'll see you back here for immigration.